would you feel if you found out that you'd been making it difficult for people in your business to flourish? What would you do if your business practices were contributing to this? And what if it was affecting up to 50% of your talent? I'm talking about the extroversion bias in organisations. And research data from Myers-Briggs, creators of the MBTI personality inventory, show that 47% of people in the UK and over 50% in the US and Canada identify as introverts. So we're not talking in significant numbers, and yet there's still so much misunderstanding. We mistakenly think of introverts as um, tongue-tied loners and extroverts as outgoing social butterflies. But what's really at the heart of this difference? The Swiss psychologist Carl Jung explains that it's to do with our mental energy, what drains and what charges our mental batteries. According to Jung, extroverts are constantly seeking interaction, active experiences and change in order to be energised. As a solar panel absorbs energy from the sun, so an extrovert absorbs energy from the people and the world about them. Their recharging is a kind of ongoing process, like a trickle charge that keeps them topped up all the while they're in stimulating situations. Their communication process is say, think, say. So they're often not particularly attached to a comment they've made. It's just a stream of consciousness. I have an extroverted colleague who says he speaks in order to understand what he's thinking. Some of you recognise that. <coughs> Introverts, on the other hand, far from needing external stimulation, are already overstimulated mentally. They're sustained by their rich world of thoughts, ideas and personal reflection. This generates a calm and peaceful energy from within. When it comes to charging, they don't have a trickle charge. They need to pay attention to their low battery warning signal. If any of you know introverts, you may have heard them say at some point, I'm all peopled out today, or I've had enough peopling. Any of you ever heard that? Yeah. When you hear that, you know that an introvert needs to remove themselves from a situation so that they can recharge. And if they can't physically remove themselves, they may go offline mentally. Imagine an introvert quietly plugging into a socket in the corner of a room to recharge and remaining there until full. That's how it works for introverts. Their communication process is think, say, think, so the opposite of the extrovert. Because it's thought through, considered and intended, it often comes out perfectly formed. But unless there's space in the conversation, they may not get to the say part of their process. What we're talking about here is diversity, neurodiversity. Businesses are already focused on the diversity and inclusion agenda, so age, disability, ethnicity, gender, etc., but maybe not enough on neurodiversity. This matters to me. It matters to me for a number of reasons. You know, there are functional neuroimaging studies that show that the brains of introverts and extroverts light up differently when stimulated in the same way. And yet there are still people in my professional community who discount the notion of introversion and extroversion. That's part of what matters to me. It matters to me because I'm an introvert, and I guess that's why I had the introduction I did, because it is a big deal to be on this stage. It matters to me because I'm an introvert and I've experienced the challenges of this extroversion bias. And I know I'm not alone. It matters to me enough to stand here and be the voice of the unheard introvert so that we start to eliminate this bias. You see, introverts are not broken in need of fixing, nor is introversion the same as shyness, social anxiety or depression. It's simply neurodiversity. The bias that we experience begins in childhood when we think there's something wrong with a child who 
prefers being on their own rather than playing noisily with others, or who doesn't call out the answers to questions eagerly in class. You know, I knew I was different from friends and family when I was a child. When other kids would be delaying bedtime for as long as possible, some of you may have done that, I would take myself to bed early in order to read. I could read for a while before lights out, and that felt like a real treat. As a young adult, I wasn't much of a party animal, preferring instead to have a quiet night in, reading, listening to music, or dare I say it, just being. I was often mocked by friends and family, called boring, stuck up, and once a colleague said to me I was dull as f <laughs> Yeah, you get it, I don't need to finish that. I actually began to feel that there was something wrong with me, and it wasn't until my mid-30s that I understood that maybe the difference that I was experiencing was down to my introversion. But understanding on its own wasn't enough, because I still didn't know how to deal with that difference. So for many years, especially in business situations, I pretended to be more extroverted in an attempt to fit in, in an attempt to be accepted. But fit in with what? Fit in with a corporate culture that expected me to speak out, to join in with the social, the small talk, the social chit-chat, to make decisions fast, to enjoy banter. In other words, behave more like an extrovert. Now, we can all flex our behaviour to some degree, but the price an introvert pays for flexing for too long is a rapidly draining battery with loss of personal power and reduced mental agility, mental energy. So when an introvert isn't flexing, is there a standard way that an introvert behaves then? Actually, there are six basic types of introvert, and the classic introvert is probably the one that we most readily recognise as how we traditionally think of an introvert. So contained, great solo worker, thoughtful, focused, probably listening and observing more than they're speaking, and they speak when they have something of value to add, not just to fill airways. But not all introverts are a classic. The other five types of introvert all have access to a range of extroverted skills and behaviours without experiencing that debilitating battery drain. That's confusing for people around them because, to all intents and purposes, they don't seem like an introvert. Take the engaging introvert, for instance. Now, an engaging introvert is an animated communicator with infectious enthusiasm who's quite at home on a large stage with a clear message. That's not how we think about introverts, is it? The other basic types, the connected, the open, the dynamic, the sociable, all have their own unique traits as well, their behaviours that they can use. But and this is important, they all share the same recharging needs. When they spend too long in an environment that expects them to pretend and use out-of-preference behaviours, they become depleted and overwhelmed. This can result in introverts feeling not OK about themselves, not OK being themselves, because it's only by pretending that they're accepted. So what are the business situations, the scenarios, where introverts typically feel not OK being themselves? One of the obvious ones is assessment centres. Now, many assessment centres are looking for that say-think-say say process. Take the group discussion task. There's some, sounds like some nods there. So, yeah, so the group discussion task. Now, typically, we know that introverts like to think things through before they share an opinion, so they typically don't shine at this element. Interviewers and assessors have told me that they mark down candidates who don't contribute enough during those discussions. I wonder if introvert Larry Page 
was marked down at some time and didn't make the cut. Maybe that's why he co-founded Google. Who knows? Imagine instead a future where people are given time to do a bit of research, to form their own opinions. And then during the discussion, they're also assessed on a wider range of communication skills, like empathic listening, meaningful observation, clarifying, summarizing, being the steadying voice of reason. A well-respected colleague of mine who designs assessment centers says she includes an individual task after the group task so that candidates are assessed on their ability to reflect, to assimilate ideas and produce a report. Now that's going to result in a more balanced assessment and, I propose, healthier diversity for the organization. What other business practices are skewed? Problem solving. A group of people being pulled together to brainstorm ideas and generate solutions. Typically, the voices that get heard are the loudest who can generate ideas the quickest. So again, not the introvert. Couple this with the resurgence of thinking aloud processes. And again, we're playing directly into that say, think, say preference. Where would we be if the ideas of Einstein or Elon Musk never got a public airing? You know, I've often found that the quietest voice is the one that delivers the most profound contribution. The one that stops us in our tracks. So imagine with me a future where unless it's an emergency, everyone is given the background and any data so that they can mull things over if they want to. For the introverts, this means they can get their creative juices flowing. Then a skilled chairperson or a facilitator will ensure there's a balance of contribution during the meeting so that the thought-through creativity of the introvert is explored alongside the spontaneous creativity that happens in the meeting. You know, a more inclusive approach to problem solving is more likely to have us solve the long-term problems and the root cause of the problems rather than thus just the presenting issues. That's a future I want to be part of. There's an area that, as a trainer, coach and facilitator, is close to my heart, and that's training courses. Early on in my career, I was a happy delegate on a course because it's part of my natural territory as a lifelong learner. And a trainer asked me a question. So I began to ponder what my response might be. But before I could answer, he moved on and asked somebody else and never came back to me for my answer. At the end of that course, I was given feedback that I was a low responder and I needed to be more confident and speak up quicker. It was never about confidence. It was about somebody not understanding my process. I have to tell you, I was seething. Not that you'd have known it, because I was seething quietly, so I wouldn't have given you any <laughs> outward indication. But it taught me a really valuable lesson. It taught me to pay attention to the needs of my whole group and not to make assumptions. Fairly recently, when delegates were sharing their objectives at the beginning of one of my courses, one of them was showing obvious signs of kind of being really uncomfortable, fidgeting a lot, <sighs> huffing and puffing, shrugging his shoulders, rolling his eyes. So I clocked there was something clearly going on here and made a decision that during the first break, I would check in with him to understand what was happening. In the first break, I shared my observation and asked him how he was, asked him what was going on. He took a really deep breath and really quietly said, please don't think I'm not interested. I just find it really hard to speak out in a group. 
I know how that feels as an introvert. I thanked him for letting me know, and we discussed ways that I could include him in the group discussions without him feeling uncomfortable so that we could benefit from his valuable contribution, and agreed that we'd check in over lunch to see how he was doing. We checked in again at the end of the day, and he said to me, I've had a good day. I'd had a good day too. When I'm running training courses or facilitating meetings, I don't use the creeping death of introductions. <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like some of you have experienced that. You see, I've found from experience that it's much better for people to decide when they're going to put their own voice in the room. And yet, possibly introverts are towards the end of that process. And maybe introverts don't contribute as much during the course, but it doesn't mean they're not engaged or not learning. I make space for the quieter voices, but I don't force them. After all, I'm creating a future where all of my delegates can flourish. There's another big area for which I don't think there's any natural, easy solution. Open plan offices. Now, I understand the commercial need for this, but they're better suited to our extroverted colleagues and, frankly, a minefield that many introverts find difficult to navigate. With the noise, the number of people, the distractions, the introverts who are already, remember, overstimulated find it hard to focus and do their best work. That doesn't bode well in a knowledge economy, does it? Their batteries are constantly draining and probably at a critically low level for most of the day. And we wonder why engagement and well-being are a problem. These are just a few of the obvious workplace scenarios where introverts struggle to be themselves. And that's without mentioning team building, away days, meetings, networking events. And, of course, day-to-day -day interactions, many of which expect us to extrovert. So I've offered a few ways that organisations can consciously create more of a level playing field for their talent. And we all have a part to play in that. But arguably, if you're a manager, an HR professional, or an employer, the change starts with you. How? I invite you to undertake three simple steps. Firstly, conduct an audit. Starting with yourself, look at where you demonstrate bias, remembering that initially, of course, it may not be conscious. But notice what you do, where you show favour, where you don't. Then turn your attention to your organisation. What is it you're doing? What practices are already offering a level playing field and which need a bit of groundwork in order to level them up? Secondly, put in place some changes that are going to eliminate this bias and start to value neurodiversity for the benefit of the whole organisation. Educate your people so that they value diversity. Make space for the quieter voices. You know, recruiting talent in a knowledge economy is an expensive business. So it makes perfect sense to create a truly inclusive culture where all can flourish. Thirdly, and finally, embed the changes, and as they do, monitor them so that they don't slip back into their old patterns, into their old ways of being. And then measure the benefits, the financial, the engagement, and the well-being benefits for both the organisation and for the people. Now, if anything that I've said has resonated with you, and you've realised that you might have been making it difficult for some of your people to flourish, it's time for action. Time to create a truly inclusive culture that values neurodiversity 
for the organisation, everyone in it, and all served by it. Don't leave 50% of your precious talent on the table. Thank you.